Shabbat Shalom, dear beloved brothers and sisters. I hope you have a wonderful time today, that you will rejoice in the Word of God, and that you will be revitalized by the life that the Word of God gives. Before we share the Word, let's bow and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that every heart will be open to receive your Word. Every ear will be open to hear and to listen what your Spirit is saying. And Father, Lord, that our hearts be softened to will and to know what your Spirit is doing and saying right now. For your glory and your name's sake, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, today we are going to talk about Isaiah 55 and the relation of these scriptures with the remnant of the last days. We know Isaiah 55 speaks of the compassion of the living God. In verse 1, it says this, as I'll read to you. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come. Buy and eat, come. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. Well, we know in the natural, if we don't drink water, if we imagine that we are in the desert and uh, we walked under the sun for a long time, we begin to dehydrate, to lose the moisture of our body, our mouth dries up, and the first thing we want to have is what? Right, water. So thirst is a form of uh, expression of a dried out. And what is water? Well, in the natural, water is what refreshes us and rehydrates us, right? So the waters are refreshing when you are really hot and when you're really thirsty and you begin to drink water, you feel so refreshed. So <coughs> in the spirit, what does it mean? Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. He says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. In the spirit realm, we thirst for what is right. In the midst of unrighteousness and injustice, what do we cry out for? Lord, let righteousness prevail. Lord, let the right things come to pass. Amen. And only righteousness of God will satisfy the soul. In Romans 14 verse 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, just food and beverage, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So here we know that it's a, a strong tie in between the Holy Ghost with righteousness, with peace and with joy because that is exactly what the Holy Ghost brings into the heart and the life of a believer. So we can say, therefore, that the waters spiritually represent the Holy Spirit and represents the waters of life without price. We cannot buy the Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> we don't have enough time here, but we know that there was a sorcerer who wanted to buy the power of the Holy Spirit from the prophets. He having actually accepted Christ and received, but he wanted, as he saw the power of God, the Holy Spirit moving and operating God's power through the apostles, over the people. He wanted that and wanted to buy it, but we cannot buy. That's why the Holy Spirit is without money and without price. Amen. And that is spoken also in Revelation 22, verse 17. So, it says also here, 
can buy wine and milk without money and without a price. And he who has no money come and buy and eat. So that's the first verse. Let's look at Proverbs 9, verse 5. What is God saying through the scriptures? Verse 5. Come eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. This is wisdom talking. If we look at Proverbs 9, we will see that wisdom is talking. And in John 7, verse 37 says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. So Jesus portrays himself also as water, and he speaks of himself as bread. So it's with thirst Jesus is the one through his Holy Spirit that will quench our thirst and we will thirst no more. And Jesus is the bread of life that will satisfy us. And the word says, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. What does this verse mean about wine and milk? Well, I could say that in Christ Jesus, we have freely been offered the waters of the Holy Spirit, right? We just spoke of that. But also the wine of the joy of our salvation. How many of us can say, no matter what pain, what sorrow, what circumstances we go through, we know deep inside that the Lord is our salvation. And eventually, there shall be no more tear and no more pain. And that is the joy of our salvation. And that represented by the wine. And milk speaks of the nourishment of the word of God. How many of us know that a baby, if it's kept without eating food, for a long period of time, he will die. So how much more a spiritual baby that is kept without nourishment and without the food of the word of God, the bread of life, can also die. This business of once saved, always saved, I'm not sure of that, that. I believe that people can lose their salvation. Just a thought. Verse 2. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? How many of us know? that people spend fortunes in courses, studies, in all sorts of learning and myriads of books that bring no satisfaction, neither life, because they are not the bread of life. This is the bread of life. This will give us nourishment, this will give us satisfaction. This will give us life. God's word gives righteousness and satisfies. Satisfaction, sorry. So he calls us to listen diligently to what he is saying in the word and eat what is good. Eat what God is actually personally saying to each of us. Eat what God is telling you. God will speak to you through the word and what it comes to your heart. That is what food, good food is for you. Eat it. Think of it. Meditate it. Delight yourself in it because it brings forth richness. 
of God into your spirit, into your soul. In John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said to the people, I am the bread of life. Whosoever comes to me shall not hunger. I repeat, whosoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whosoever believes in me shall never thirst again. Whosoever believes in me shall never thirst. So should we search for any other? Should we come at the feet of any other by Jesus? Will we continuously hungry for more? And is whatever the Lord says, we refuse to believe it as the truth, we will always be thirsting for truth. Verse 3. Incline your ears and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you a covenant everlasting, my steadfast, sure love for David. I read in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1, 2, and 4, and he said this, A father is wise, father's wise instruction. Hear, O oh my son, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. Verse 2, For I give you good precepts, and do not forsake my teachings. Verse 4, he taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. So, it is very clear that without the word of God, we have no insight. Therefore, no revelation, neither much wisdom. Wisdom from above. Wisdom from God. For he gives us always good instructions. But God's instruction is do not forsake my teaching. He teaches us very valuable life, important tools to live a, a, a blessed life, a holy life, a happy, a joyful life. For who is God but the one who teaches us to hold fast into his word that we may live? Jesus is life and his life is the light of men. Therefore, without Jesus, we walk in darkness and we have no life. We are talking about everlasting life. We are talking about a spiritual life. For man can have earthly life, but not eternal, only very temporary. But to have eternal life, man must come to Jesus. Man must receive his words his instructions, embrace them. For then man shall live. In verse 4 says, Behold, I made him a witness to people, a leader to commanders, talking about David, for the people. Now, how many of us might want to be in these last days God's witness or the witness of God's power that the world may know, ah, this is God. For they see through us the revelation of his power and might that will promote us into leadership, leaders and commanders of the people. For the people will realize that God is with us, that God is real, that God is powerful and mighty, and they will follow. They will follow the God 
that we represent and we give witness of. Verse 5. Behold, you shall call a nation people that you do not know. And a nation that did not know you shall run to you. Because the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, He has glorified you. Wow. How many of us would like to be the ones that God glorifies? That God brings them into brilliance, into a well-known place where people will run to you. Why? Because God will glorify his people in the last day and they will move in the power of his glory and the people of the world will run to them because they are running to the living God that are in them, that is in them. They are running to the glory of God that exudes from them. And this is what God is about to do for the end time remnant. He will glorify them. They will brightly represent his glory and nations, groups of people, will, even people that you don't even know, they will follow you. But what are the instructions there for? For those people, for, for them. In Amos chapter 5, verse 4 to 6, I read these scriptures which are very interesting and I believe they have some tie with what God is saying in Isaiah 55. Verse 4, For that says the Lord to the house of Israel. That means to every believer, right? And, you know, to house of Israel is talking to Jews and Gentiles, the end time army. Seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel. And do not enter Gilgal or cross over to Beersheba. For Gilgal shall surely go, go unto exile. Hmm. And Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live. Lest the Lord breaks forth out like fire in the house of Joseph. And it devours with none to quench for it. For Bethel. Bethel. What is God saying? We're certainly saying this. Do not seek Bethel. Seek the Lord. And he said, do not enter Gilgal. Seek the Lord and live. But perhaps it will be uh, profitable to find out what is God saying about Bethel and Gilgal. Okay, let's look at, do not enter into Gilgal. Gilgal in Hebrew means a circle of stones and also a roll away. Now, this is interesting. Researching about Gilgal, I found this. That before the assault of Ai and Jericho, the Israelites set up camp and deposited the 12 stones from the Jordan River. And Joshua was asked there to circumcise the remnant or the descendants of the slaves that escaped from Egypt. That is in Joshua chapter 4, verse 19 and 20. So what, what does this mean? Well, when I read this, I, I felt it's talking about a place of God's presence where salvation comes and deliverance. For the 12 stones represent an altar. The altar represents and brings forth the presence of God where God can dwell. And it is God who brings salvation and deliverance. 
So that is all very good, Gilgal. God declares this act of circumcision that Joshua had to do for the people of Israel or for the remnant and the descendants of those that escaped from Egypt as a roll away from the reproach of Egypt. That is why I thought salvation and deliverance from the point of view of a place where the presence of God is. A presence where God a place where the presence of God is supposed to be brings salvation and brings deliverance. And that is a good thing. A roll away from the reproach of the world that is represented by Egypt. But number two is another point. In Gilgal, King Saul assembled the Israelites and prepared them for battle. Prophet Samuel was supposed to come and do uh, sacrifices, but he was delayed in his arriving. Therefore, the army got discouraged and King Saul, under pressure, decided to do the sacrifices himself. However, at the arrival of Prophet Samuel, King Saul was rebuked and declared that God, and uh, Prophet Samuel declared that God has rejected him as a king. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 13 to chapter 15. So what are the points that are highlighted in this act in Gilgal? Well, what happened is the people of authority being the king, disobeyed God's command because kings could not offer sacrifice, only the prophets. Secondly, so they are the person of authority is disobeying and not doing God's will. Second, he made a decision not based in God's instructions. He made his own decision by his own flesh, by the pressures of his emotions. So in this place, there, where there is disobedience, the decisions are carnal. And as a result, the warfare is in the flesh. Conclusion. A message to the believers that are called to be the remnant of the Lord. Do not go where there is salvation and deliverance, but also disobedience, carnal decisions, and fleshy warfare. Simple. Do not, do not go. Do not enter Gilgal. Don't enter those places. Now, it also says do not seek Bethel. What does Bethel mean? Bethel means the house of God, a prominent place of worship in God's Old Testament. Okay. In Genesis 12, verse 8, Abraham built an altar. In Genesis 33, 18 and 34, 31, upon his return to Palestine, Jacob did not keep his vows. God directs him to go to Bethel, chapter 35, verse 1, and Jacob puts away the foreign gods, verse 4, went to Bethel and built a promised altar to the Lord, verse 7. And again, the Lord appeared to him and changed his name from Jacob to Israel, verse 14. What does this have to do with today? Well, I think God is saying, do not seek Bethel. How many of us know that in the last few years, people were desperate because they wanted to fellowship with one another, go to church and mingle to each other, but they were not able to. In these last days, Bethel could be what it was in the times 
of Jeroboam the first, which is written in 1 King chapter 12, verse 29, where Jehoboam chose Bethel, the place where God was present, the place that, as we spoke before, where repentance was, when the presence of God, when God changed the name from, from uh, Jake, um, Jacob to Israel. But Jehoram, Jeroboam, King Jeroboam, chooses this place, Bethel, as a place for the worship of calf, or his calf worship. And though he was rebuked by the prophet of Judah, 1 King chapter 13 from 1 to verse 1 to 3, he did not repent. And therefore, much time later, God declares to the prophet Amos unequivocally predicting its doom, saying, it will come to nothing. Therefore, conclusion, do not seek a church, seek the Lord. Therefore, beloved, in the name of the Lord, I speak unto you with all of my heart. Let not your heart seek a place as, as such. Do not use a building where the saints gather together as a replacement of God himself. This is the point that God is making. The end time army, the remnant army, will not replace God by church. God is changing all that. And how many of us know that in places of worship that is supposed to be called church where God is supposed to be there, there are calves being worshipped. There's compromise, acceptance of abominable things. As okay, as acceptable. When this is happening in some areas of the body of Christ, I warn you, I plead with you, do not go there. Do not seek this kind of church. Rather, seek the Lord. Because without the Lord, you cannot live, neither survive these last days. These last days will be treacherous. And all those that are really close to the Lord, that have put him as first priority, not just a building that will replace or a fellowship that will replace God, where we go and pay our, our dues and for the rest of the week we live like a world. No, 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 no. I know God is talking to some of you. You cannot survive. Forsake it. Let go. Because you cannot survive. If you want to survive and be a remnant church, full of the power of the Holy Ghost, be the one whom he glorifies, be the one to whom the nations, the group of people will come running to, the ones that are a witness of the, the amazing power of God upon the earth, that people will know that God is real. If you want to be that, don't replace God with a church. Be wise. Be wise, my beloved. And do not compromise. Because also, Gilgal was a place where God was and ended up also being a place where abominations took place, such as disobedience, carnal decisions, fleshy warfare. Even though there might be salvation, even though 
many may be delivered. But for as long as there is disobedience, for as long as there is compromise, for as long as the decisions are made by the flesh and not the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God never contradicts the Word of God. Anything that is decided outside the Word of God is not from the Spirit of God, but from the flesh. What kind of warfare, successful warfare, can take place in that condition? So, beloved, it's like coming to fight a giant with a little plastic knife rather than an amazing sword, the sword of the Spirit, do not seek Bethel. Do not enter Gilgal. This is the message of the Lord for the last day's remnant from Isaiah 55. Today, we will leave it here and we'll continue with verse 6 and onward in the next time, next Shabbat, where we meet again. Until then, be blessed. May the Lord God Almighty bring forth much joy and peace in your hearts through these words. For they are words of encouragement, of correction, of revelation, enlightenment. Father, I have spoken your word as you have given it to me. Let the power of your spirit be so real, so tangible in the surroundings and the hearts of those that have heard these words. Bring him forth a complete transformation and a change what is needed an empowerment where is needed Father we commit all this into your holy hands and thank you that you're hearing these prayers and thank you for the amazing plan of salvation for the wonderful sacrifice Christ made for the power of your Holy Spirit in man and the wonderful plan of complete deliverance in the last days. In Jesus' name, Amen. Bless you, dear beloved. In Jesus' name, until we meet again, the Lord be with you.